hot topics because a lot of the things that we're going to touch on are kind of hot button issues and some of them more so than others and um, and the more I'm going through some of these the more I'm realizing how long the list is of contemporary issues that we're dealing with in our society that God speaks to so I'll probably be I'll probably be putting this on hold coming up here soon and maybe we'll do a part two uh, uh, into next year at some point uh, just because there are so many and um, and if you have any any that you'd like to see, have a Bible study on, please let me know. People have brought up, you know, uh, you know, what about, um, um, uh, what about, you know, tattoos? What about, uh, what about, um, you know, uh, alcohol? What about this gender issue? What about whatever? Um, these are some things I want to see. What does God say? And sometimes you'll be surprised. God doesn't say anything <laughs> you know, on some issues uh, that we've made up things with our tradition. Other things, God has actually said more than we were willing to admit sometimes. And uh, so we'll look at a few things, but um, uh, tonight I want to look at something that has so permeated our society that even Christians have changed positions on it, and I'm talking good churches. Uh, Christians have been in violation of this and stayed in ministry, and, um, and uh, quite frankly, uh, I think I'm very much in the minority position on this issue, but we want to see what God has to say on it. And so... Um, so we're going to open with Ecclesiastes 5. Look at verse number 4. It's a very important passage. It says, uh, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. And then it goes on in verse number 5. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest, ma- uh, shouldest vow and not pay. Interesting in this passage, God calls somebody a fool to make a vow or to enter into a vow or to enter into a covenant and break it. He said that is a very foolish thing to do. I'm reminded even in Revelation, next to murderers and other things, it says all liars have their place in the lake of fire. I mean, God's serious about these things, uh, about um, um, you know, keeping our word, being people of our word. Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay nay. And, and let's, uh, you know, we shouldn't have to swear by things. Let's, uh, let's uh, be, be people of our word. And, um, and this is very specific in what we're going to talk about tonight because we're talking about uh, the breaking of the marriage covenant. And uh, we're going to talk about that just a little bit this evening. But let's have a word of prayer as we get into this. Father, thank you for our time together tonight. And I do pray, Lord, that... Um, that uh, this, this message tonight will help equip us of really the, the way that you view marriage and the importance of it and, uh, and, and really, in some regards, uh, the important aspect of how we want to set a good course, not only for our church, but for our children. And Lord, there are a lot of people that have made a lot of mistakes, and not just in this area, but in a lot of areas in life. And Lord, I pray that we'd learn from them, grow from them, but, uh, but, but even better yet, that we would uh, end it with us and that we could pass on to the next generation the, a more better way. And Lord, I pray that you would just guide us into your word, into the scriptures. May your word be true and everyone found a liar uh, in relation to your word. May, uh, may the truth be upheld tonight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible tells us in Malachi 6, uh, 2.16, uh, For the Lord, the God of Israel... Uh, say, saith that he hateth putting away. He hates the putting away. He hates, he hates this concept of cutting off or divorcing a spouse. Uh, a while back, I watched a, um, a video. Uh, this, mo- this morning, I think it's in the new members class, I talked about uh, uh, what I've deemed as YouTube theologians, people that get their, um, their theology from little five to ten minute uh, snippets on, online or whatnot, and they've kind of developed their theology because somebody knows how to put together a fun video. Right, or a fancy video, and there's a plethora of videos like that on YouTube. Some good, uh, a lot that's garbage, <laughs> but they'll say, you know, uh, uh, here's, here's what the Bible says about this topic, and they throw it together in, you know, two minutes. And I'm thinking, what about this passage? What about this passage? What about this passage? Well, one of those groups that does that a lot, and a lot of their stuff's good, I've even shared some of their stuff, is a group called Wretched TV. I'm going to it's Wretched TV. Todd Friel. And uh, he did a video on biblical reasons uh, that, uh, uh, that God permits divorce. He gave three reasons when God allows divorce. And, uh, and I listened to it, and I thought, Todd, you're wrong on all three, on all three. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, we want to be careful that we're not just doing proof text theology. We're taking Scripture in its context. But, uh, but uh, we're going to look at some of these. The first one that he brings up 
is this topic of immorality. And so we're going to start in Matthew. Let's jump over there in Matthew. The reason I thought I'd do this one tonight is because I briefly touched on it this morning in the morning message about, um, about Joseph. I think Joseph is a great example to help illustrate what Jesus is talking about in Matthew. Um, but do me a favor, so, we, so for sake of time, uh, hold your spot there in Matthew 19, and let's also look at Mark, um, Mark 10. In, uh, in Mark 10, in fact, we'll read this one first. Uh, let me back up to, let's see. Mark 10 in verse number 2 is where we'll start. So Pharisees come to Jesus. By the way, when the Pharisees come to Jesus, is it because they want to learn? They want to grow, right? No, they always want to trip him up, right? And so they come to Jesus. Look at verse number 2. And the Pharisees came unto him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? And it says, tempting him. So we know the, the heart behind them asking this question. Is it lawful for man to put away his wife? And the answer is said to them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this uh, precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Uh, boy, that verse answers some questions today, does it not? Um, God made them male and female. There's two there. Add them up, one, two. Um, verse 7, uh, I like what one person said. He said, uh, uh, God, God made up two genders. The, the Democrats made up the rest. And, uh, <laughs> um, but he made them male and female. Um, where did I leave off? Uh, verse 6. Verse 7, For this cause shall man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And uh, and in the in the house of uh, excuse me, and in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he said unto them, uh, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put her uh, hu uh, put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. So in Mark's gospel, Jesus basically says, Look. If you divorce and you get married to somebody else, you are living in adultery. That is an adulterous relationship. Let's turn over to Matthew's gospel. Same passage, same, or same scenario. This is a parallel passage in Matthew's gospel. But what's interesting is to kind of consider the, the tone of the book. Matthew is written... Uh, is written primarily with the, the Jews in mind. He, in, in the book of Matthew, they're referencing the law very often. Uh, they're not having to unpack it or explain it. They're assuming the, the reader understands the law, knows the law. And uh, so there's a lot of reference to the law and with a Jewish mindset. Jesus in, in Matthew is presented as the, as the king. He's presented as king. In Mark's gospel, the presentation is slightly different. Jesus is presented as a servant. And his primary audience was, uh, was the, the Romans, the, um, those that were, if you would, uh, converted Gentiles. And so, so there's a lot less of, uh, of that mentality. And so Jews, of course, looking for their king, he says, hey, the king has come. The Romans, they love power, they love authority. They say, okay, so the greatest among you will be the servant of all. So Jesus presented as a servant. And so what's interesting is in Mark's gospel, because there's no background of, of, uh, of the of, uh, um, of the law and so forth, he just cuts straight to the chase. He says, look, if somebody, if a man puts away his wife, uh, he commits adultery. If the wife puts away her uh, husband and, and marries another, they commit adultery. And so look at uh, what he says in Matthew 19. Same thing, they came to him to tempt him, uh, tempt Jesus. And um, <clears throat> let's go to, um, yeah, um, so, so when he answered, he said, uh, you know, God made them from the beginning male and female and so forth. In verse number 7 of, of Matthew 19, it says, They said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? By the way, did Moses command them to divorce? No. And so Jesus kind of challenges that, and he says unto them, Moses, because the hardness of your hearts suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Uh, to suffer someone to do something versus to command someone to do something are two different things. Moses allowed it. 
He hits the nail on the head again. Uh, he suffered it um, because of the hardness of their hearts. But from the beginning, it was not so. In other words, from the beginning, this was not God's plan. This was not God's intention. Verse number 9. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now in, Mark's, or in Matthew's gospel, he throws in an exception clause. Now what's interesting is we've already referenced Moses. Now I've heard a lot of sermons on, on divorce and uh, in this passage and everything, and he references Moses. But I've never heard a sermon where the pastor takes you or the preacher takes you to where Jesus is referencing. Where in the law is he talking about? What is this passage that he is saying, uh, you know, he suffered you know, to divorce or he commanded to write a bill of divorcement or whatnot? And so I kind of, I kind of struggled with that, thinking, you know, where, where is this? And so what did I do? I looked into it. I said, where, where is this mentioned? Where is this, this at? And so, so let's look at a couple of places. The first time this concept is mentioned is in Deuteronomy 22. And while you're turning there, let me go ahead and turn there. I'm going to kind of explain something here real quick. And uh, again, in verse number 9, Jesus is saying, by, by the way, I know this is kind of an uncomfortable topic, a difficult topic, and I want to, I want to say this. Um, what's, a lot of us carry baggage. A lot of us deal with things in our life, in our past. And, uh, and God's desire, desire for us is not to shame us. God's desire for us is that we grow past it. We grow from it, right? And sometimes there's a need for, you know, repenting of things. There's a need for uh, certain things. But, uh, but, but I, we want to be careful. I know sometimes people get very uncomfortable when we talk about this, even though the Bible talks about it, because, oh, be careful. Don't you know there are divorced people in the church? Or don't you know this, that? Yes, and, and I, want to, I want to try to handle and tread lightly as much as possible. But, uh, but, but I also want to say this. We have children coming up. And I want them to know what the Bible says. And I want them to know what's right. Right? We, have a, we have newlyweds here. I want them to know, look, it's not okay to, to consider divorce. You guys need to make this thing work. Right? And, and you married Derek. So, I mean, you're going to have to try to make this thing work. And, uh, um, but what does the Bible say? Right? And let, let's let the Bible formulate things. Right? It is amazing how we can, we can decide decisions that we're going to make ahead of time before we're tempted based on the conviction we have in our heart of what the Bible said. Right? That's what I'm trying to do with my children. I want them to instill some biblical convictions before they're tempted so that when that temptation comes, they already know, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not going that direction, you see? And so, so I want to treat this the same way I would treat, say, somebody who maybe had a past with alcohol and talk about the dangers of alcohol or someone who had a past with drugs and the dangers of drugs or, you know, or different things that are just detrimental to somebody. And so we want to... Um, so if you guys will um, allow me to, 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 to share this, I also want to give us some ammunition of what does the Bible say when we see things all around us. And, um, and so look at verse 9 uh, again. I, I told you to turn to Deuteronomy, but, 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 uh, but in verse 9 of Matthew 19 again, sorry. sorry. Um, he says, I say unto you, whoso shall put away his wife, and here's the exception clause he gives, except to be for fornication and shall marry another committeth adultery. And whoso marries another, uh, her or her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Do you believe that every word is important in the Bible? Every word of God is pure, the Bible tells us. And, uh, and, and, and this is an aspect of how we approach the Scriptures. This is an aspect of hermeneutics, how we study the Scriptures. There are those that believe that God preserved His word, kind of general ideas. Then there are those that believe God preserved every word. And I'm of the camp that God preserved every word, uh, every jot and every tittle. And, uh, and so words are important. There are translations that render this except for immorality. By the way, immorality is a pretty broad word. Or except different things. Now, what's interesting about this is they'll take this then and say, so therefore, if somebody is unfaithful, that is the one reason that God gives to allow divorce. All right? Well, I mean, honestly, if you want to, if you want to take it to that level, then, then if your marriage is bad enough, then just go and cheat on your spouse, and now you're free to divorce. We will find these loopholes if we're not careful, okay? But what's interesting, though, is the word that's used. Both words are used here, adultery and fornication. If you're married to somebody, 
and you cheat on your spouse, what does the Bible call that? Adultery, right? The Proverbs talks about uh, the one who commits adultery. They lack understanding. Um, adultery, that is, that is when you are married and you've committed immorality. You've cheated, you know, you've, you've stepped outside the bounds of your marriage, right? What is it called if, if a young person steps into immorality who is not married? Fornication, right? Now, I know fornication, one of the arguments is, well, fornication is a very broad word. It's from the Greek pornea, where we get the word pornography, um, and it's a very broad word. It's kind of all-encompassing of all immorality, and that is true, how it's usage in many places. But what's interesting is how Jesus used both words in the same sentence. He did not say, except to be for the cause, except for the cause of adultery. He said, except for fornication. And so in that wretched TV video, he, he went on to say, if, if someone is stepped in uh, ongoing, ongoing, continual uh, uh, immorality, then that's grounds for divorce. And I was thinking, but the, script, the text doesn't say ongoing. The text doesn't say, you know, start to unpack it in that way. It simply says, except for the cause of fornication. So if a married person steps out on their marriage, and it's called adultery, how in the world could they commit fornication? And then maybe one of the arguments would be, well, you know, fornication or adultery is included in the, the broad umbrella of that. I don't think that's what he's talking about here because we have to put ourselves back into the Jewish mindset that is being written to here. Notice how Mark did not mention this. Matthew did mention this. Okay, that's important to understand. So what is the Jewish custom? The Jewish custom, as we looked at this morning, uh, with Joseph and Mary. Joseph sought to divorce his wife. That's what the Bible tells us. But was Mary his wife as we would consider it husband and wife today? No. What were they? They were espoused is the word that's used. They were espoused. And I kind of mentioned it this morning when an espousalment would happen in the Jewish custom, the two would come together. There'd be a great feast. The family would come together. And there, there would be an exchange of vows. There'd be a promise. She becomes espoused to him, and they are promised to each other. And that man would then say, okay, now I need to go and prepare to receive you to myself. Right? I've known of dads that uh, um, a young man comes along and wants to uh, uh, ask for his daughter, uh, her hand in marriage. And I've known of guys that will say, okay, once you do this, this, and this, I'll let you have her. Amen. And, uh, uh, you know, and it's kind of interesting. And uh, uh, what is it in Africa? How many cows? Zimbabwe, 40 cows. Uh, Zimbabwe, 40 cows to purchase a wife, okay? And uh, so every cult, you know, we got, our, we got our own things. And then others will say, please take her. And, uh, <laughs> um, um, but, uh, but, but either way, uh, so, so here's Joseph, espoused to Mary. And then here's, here's what would take place. And by the way, see if this sounds familiar. The, the, the husband or the bridegroom would go away for a season. And he'd go and begin preparing a place for her. That where he is, she may be also. And when the place is prepared, he goes to her and receives her unto himself. Isn't that cool? Isn't that exactly what Jesus was saying? Uh, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am you may be also. And, uh, and the promise that he, he will come and receive uh, you to himself. So, so anyways, we see that beautiful picture. But that's what would take place. Now, in the process of that time, if the woman is found to be unfaithful, now what is it called before you're married? Fornication. He can give her a writing of divorcement and cut the thing off. By the way, that espousal man had such a connection to it, that's what would be required. Uh, that, in fact, it's during that time period, if the husband were to have died, she actually would have been considered a widow who is a virgin. That's kind of an interesting concept, right? A widow who is a virgin. And, uh, but that, that's what that would have been. And so here would have been a divorced virgin, in a sense. But, uh, but she, well, I guess it wouldn't have been a virgin because there was a reason it was cut off. But... But, uh, but that's, that's the, the, the layout. Once the marriage has been consummated, once they've come together and she's been received by the husband, then, th then that's, that's the done deal. That is the fulfillment of the vow, the covenant relationship 
that for better or worse, I think a great example of this is, is Hosea, the book of Hosea. Boy, I tell you what, Hosea's wife, uh, amazing what God, by the way, God told Hosea, a godly priest, to go and marry a prostitute. What if God told you to do something like that? We talked this morning about bearing shame, right? That'd be rough. It's amazing how God would take, God would take his prophets through some horrible things to simply be a testimony to God's people, to tell them a message, to get a hold of them. And so here's this godly priest who's never touched anything unclean, and he marries a prostitute. And not only that, but she keeps cheating on him. She keeps running around. In fact, so much so that he names the children, not mine, not my kid. He named the child, <laughs> child of an illegitimate relationship, basically. I mean, that's pretty rough. She so cheats on him, and he keeps taking her back. He gets to the point that she's finally just so used up that she's, she's on the auction block to be sold into slavery. And what does he do? He goes back and buys her again. Beautiful picture of redemption, um, but also a tremendous picture of suffering in marriage. Boy, we don't like to hear that today, right? We like to say, well, you deserve to be happy. You deserve all the best and all this stuff. And if he doesn't treat you right, if she doesn't treat you right, then in, wait a minute. Is that what we're called to do? Um, it's amazing how things change if, uh, if, if, you, uh, if you're stuck in it. And I know marriage should not be viewed as I'm stuck in this thing. But in the worst case scenario, guess what? You're stuck. In the best case, this is wonderful. I'm excited to go home at night, okay? Um, but uh, but when, when you have to deal with it, it changes things. Because now I'm going to make it work. Now I'm going to put something into it, you know? Rather than, you know what? You burnt the meal for the last time. We're done. Because <laughs> you have an out. You know, one of the craziest things that we do in our culture is this idea of a prenuptial. You know what we're saying? When this fails... You've already quit. You've already given up. Have you ever known somebody that um, had cancer? Maybe it was terminal. And they suffered with such grace. Have you ever known somebody like that? And you think, wow, you are really taking this well. But the reality is, do they have a choice? They either make the most of it, or they're just miserable to the grave. Because there's nothing they can do about it. They're kind of a slave to whatever happens to them. And that's how we'll treat something that comes our way, right? Uh, you know, Jabin's accident, he lost a leg. Is there anything he can do to change that? Could he get angry at it? Could he get bitter? He could, but it's not going to make the leg come back. You see? So what does he do? He embraces it. He says, you know what? I'm still going to play football. I'm still going to pursue my passion. I'm still going to, you know, and what's he doing? He's taking that trial and saying, I'm going to use this, you see. And, um, and we'll, we'll treat things like that when we realize there's no other, other way. But it's amazing, all of a sudden, when there's something that we can change, how we don't choose to suffer, we choose to run away from the trial. I'll tell you what, my wife and I think we have such a tremendous marriage. But there's been some trials, and there's been some times, mostly her, where it'd be tempting to run away. But the problem is I'll run after her, and that, I told her if she ever leaves me, I'm coming with her. Um, but I'll tell you what, as we've suffered through those things, it has so strengthened us. I mean, uh, you know, and, and I'll be honest with you, if, if, if she didn't have the convictions she has, if I didn't have the convictions that I have, we probably would have been divorced. 20 years of marriage, I'm so thankful for this woman. But we had a conviction and a commitment early on that no matter what comes our way, that, that we're going to be faithful, we're going to keep this vow, and, uh, and the devil may throw things at us, this world may throw things at us, but you know what? Divorce is just not an option. And you know, it's, it's interesting. I've counseled with a lot of couples. When we say things like for better or worse, we think of things like, you know, for worse, like if I get laid off of my job, 
for worse if other people attack me. And we never want to think that the for worse might actually be what's in that marriage. The for worse might actually be how I treat my wife. The for worse might be how she treats me. We never think of it that way. No, he's Prince Charming. Yeah, you hang on for a little bit. You'll find out. <laughs> Reality's going to kick in. And I'm just saying there's some things in life we should have convictions. The Bible says, in this world you shall have tribulation. Well, it shouldn't be in my marriage. Sometimes it is. And it's going to be up to you to make a difference. All right, I told Derek and Marion, I said, I said, you know, this marriage, when we, when we had your wedding, this, uh, this marriage, you guys have the potential, the opportunity to, uh, to, you know, the person, I think I said this way, the person whose hand you hold uh, has potential uh, to, how did I say this, make you, to, to, to give you such joy in this world. More joy, yes, that's what it is, more joy than anyone else in this world. But the person whose hand you hold also has the, uh, more potential to hurt you than anyone else in this world. And it's going to be what you choose. It's going to be what you choose after the hurts come. It's going to make the difference. And so what I'm saying is, you know, when you have cancer, guess what? You embrace it because you have no choice. But when, when you can cut it off, all of a sudden you're thinking, you know what? Maybe that's the best choice. And sometimes we're called to suffer. But anyways, back to the text here, because we do want to see, uh, you don't want to just hear counseling. You want to say, what does the Bible say? What does God say in his word? And so, uh, so here's, here's Jesus saying, except for fornication. So you say, preacher, I need some evidence. I need some, some more than this. So let's look at what Moses was talking about when he referenced Moses. Look at Deuteronomy 22. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 22. Um, of course, we're in a section where he's unpacking all kinds of different laws and customs and so forth. And in Deuteronomy 22, again, talking to Israel, uh, uh, they're receiving their law from Moses. And uh, Deuteronomy 22, look at verse number, um, let's start with 13. If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her, and give occasion of speech against her, and bring up an evil name upon her, and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Uh, then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man's wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasion of speech against her, saying, I found thy daughter a maid, uh, uh, excuse me, not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. And the elders of the city shall take the man and ch uh, chastise him. And they shall, uh, they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver uh, and give them unto the father of the damsel because he hath brought up an evil name upon the virgin of Israel. And she shall be his wife, and he may not put her away all his days. By the way, remember when they asked, they said, they said uh, is it lawful to put away the, your wife for any reason? Here's the guy who had a reason, and they said, nope, the reason's not good enough. You're going to stay married. Verse 20. But if the thing be true, and the tokens of virginity uh, be not found on the dam uh, for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of the city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shall thou put evil away from among you. I know this gets graphic, and this is kind of a crazy scenario, but here's the scene, and here's the language that's being used. He goes to his wife and, find, and finds that... She is not a virgin as she said she was, right? So she goes to the father and says, hey, I found her. She was not a virgin. And then it talks about the tokens of virginity. I'm not going to get into all that, but, uh, but let's just say that's, yeah, the token, the evidence that she was a virgin, in fact. And, uh, and if they're able to find this evidence, then they'll say, you are a liar. You have to keep her as your wife. But if they don't find the evidence... And it's saying found out to be true that she actually wasn't a virgin. She wasn't pure as, uh, as he was hoping. Then the, the first option is they could stone her with stones that she die. Okay? Because God was concerned about purity in Israel. By the way, just the, I know you, you might think, what? this is a crazy passage. This is, this is, you know, this should tell us some things what God thinks about these things. And how vile our culture has become before God. 
I mean, this is some weighty. So you might say, that's a little extreme, isn't it? That's how God feels about it. So that's option number one. You find, you find out that you, the one you were espoused to was unfaithful. Option number one, you take her before uh, the elders and she'll be stoned with stones. Option number two, this was the option that Joseph was going to take. Joseph was a just man. He was going to put her away privately. He, or privately. he was not going to stone her with stones. He was not going to make a public example of her. Look at Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24. When a man, uh, verse 1, when a man had taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because, she hath, uh, because he hath found some uncleanness in her. That's a similar language, that, uh, that she was not clean, she was not pure. Uncleanness in her. Then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she has departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. So this gives the opportunity for her. You know, he says, you know what? You weren't clean. You weren't um, pure. Uh, you can go out and you're free to go and marry another. And so he gives her the, the, the bill of divorcement. She can go out and be another man's wife. And uh, so that would be option number two. This is one that, that, um, that protects her a little bit, if you would. And the way that, uh, the way that um, Joseph was planning on doing it, he was just going to do it quietly. And he's just going to say, you know, you, you can go and, and if you find someone who will take you and help raise the son. You can go and do that. Uh, that was the plan. And so here are our two options. We can privately and not ruin her life, let her go and live her life, or we can make an example of her and have her stoned with stones. But either way, the time period for this is prior to them coming together and he receives her as his wife. Okay. And, um, uh, and so that's what Jesus was talking about, this whole right and divorcement thing. If we were to put it in equivalent today, I know an espousalment is a little bit tighter connection than, uh, uh, than what we would have as, uh, as being engaged. But if we were to put it in just a modern day equivalent, it would be, I was engaged to this person, found she was cheating on me, and I broke it off. That's basically what Jesus was talking about there. But once the marriage has, come to, well, has been consummated and that commitment has been made, um, the clause goes away because it would then be labeled as adultery. Okay. Uh, are we okay so far? All right. Um, and then of course, what's interesting about that is even if, let me just, let me just put an if there, even if this passage is how a lot of people take it, where it says, uh, where they basically say, well, uh, your husband cheated on you. You're free to go and marry somebody else. Let me ask you, did Jesus say you're free to go and marry somebody else? No. It says, except to be for the cause of fornication. But he doesn't talk about marrying somebody else. If somebody puts away his wife, except for the cause of fornication. And marries another. So a lot of people will say, you're off the hook. It's not a sin if you go and marry someone else now. No, no, a vow is still a vow. And so Paul speaks further to that uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians, which, which we'll get into the next point here. But if you want to go to 1 Corinthians 7 real quick. So, so Todd Friel on Wretched TV said there are three reasons uh, that God permits divorce. The first one is ongoing sexual immorality, to which I say, I, I don't think the Bible teaches that. And so uh, I, I will say to him, sorry, I, I love Wretched TV. I love what you guys do, but uh, I'm going to have to say no on that one. I'm going to say you're wrong. Um, so the next one, he said, was if an uh, unbeliever abandons a believer, then you are free to divorce and remarry. Um, look at, uh, look at first Corinthians seven. And, uh, we'll start in verse number 10. It says unto the married or to couples, I command yet and I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. And what's interesting is that, that that's in the passive tense that, that in the other words, she has been made to depart. So in other words, don't, you know, uh, couples, guys, don't kick your wife out of the house. And wives, don't leave your husband. That's kind of, kind of what's being said there in uh, verse number 11. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. So there's your two options. By the way, if it does come to that place where you say, uh, you know what? I just cannot put up with uh, that anymore, and you do, 
you do go ahead and cut this thing off. By the way, God hates divorce. I would never counsel divorce. Uh, I may counsel separation for safety purposes, okay? But, um, but God hates divorce. We need to see if there's any possible way of reconciling this thing and fixing it and going forward. Um, but, uh, but if it does get to that place, his disciples even said to him in Matthew 19, he said, this is a hard saying. And Jesus has a very interesting statement where he says, uh, you know, this is only for those to whom it's been given. That's an interesting statement. But, you know, there are those that will just flat out reject truth. Now, is that going to make you go to hell? Is that going to cause you to lose your salvation? No. But it's never going to be for your benefit to violate Scripture. Okay? Um, so, so here we are now. He says, uh, he says look... If she does leave, or if there has been but a putting away, uh, remain unmarried or be reconciled to your husband. Those are two choices. Okay. Uh, verse number 12. Um, and, uh, uh, um, oh, says, and let not the husband put away his wife. But the rest I speak, uh, speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So here's a, here's a believer married to an unbeliever. And he says, uh, he says, if, if the unbeliever is okay with your faith, don't put them away. Allow them, you know, make this marriage work. And the woman which hath an husband believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, now they are holy. By the way, <clears throat> this is not saying that the wife saves the husband or the husband saves the wife, but, it, but it's really talking about the environment, the potential for that environment. Right? The child has an opportunity to hear the gospel. The child has an opportunity to, to, to you know, uh, you think about families that are split up and, and they have on the one side a very secular upbringing and then on the other side a religious upbringing. It becomes very difficult, but it says, you know what, if you guys are able to stay together in harmony, right? We've had several, uh, in our ministry, we've had several uh, ladies who, who loved God, wanted to raise their children for the Lord, and, and, had, and honestly, they had good husbands. They're lost. But they were, they were good, and they, and they were pleased to dwell with them and to stay with them, as it says here. And, um, and those children were able to be in church. They were able to grow and those kinds of things. And so it truly is a better environment. But he goes on, and he says, um, verse 15, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such case. But God hath called us to peace. Now, that under bondage is a very interesting statement. Um... um let me see here. I have a little note in my, uh, my side here. When I was studying through this passage a while back, I want to see if it's relevant here. Okay, yeah. Um, just some little notes I have there that you even uh, don't put away uh, an unbeliever even. But, uh, but basically, uh, the unbeliever, if they depart, it says, let them depart. You're not under bondage in that, in that instance. Now, a lot of people take that under bondage saying, see, you're not under bondage in the sense that you are now free. You are free to remarry. You're free to go on. But that under bondage is the idea of you're no longer bound in the sense of your duty as a spouse. Okay? My, one of my duties as a spouse, as a husband, is to provide for my wife. I'm to love her, care for her, et cetera, et cetera, right? If, say, she's a lost person and finally just has had enough with my fanatic religion and she leaves, right? It, uh, it's not my job to just uh, um, show up at her house and say, well, I'm going to take care of you anyway. I'm going to force myself to take care of you, you know? Uh, that's where restraint orders come in, all right? Um, uh, you're no longer under bondage in that sense. But remember what we saw earlier on you're still not free to marry another. Okay? Um, uh, so let's go on. But, uh, but then it says, um, um, you know, for in such case God hath called us to peace. Uh, verse 16, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God has uh, distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, let him so walk, so ordain, ordain I in all the churches. And, and in other words, what he's saying is this, live with what you've got. Live with what you've got. So, he, uh, and if we were to go with the whole context, he's saying, hey, you know what? For, this, for the single and the widows, you know what? If you're okay with it, just stay that way. That's a gift, by the way. In this whole context, you know what we tend to talk about? We, talk, we tend to talk about singleness being a burden and a curse. 
And then you get married, and we start talking about marriage being a curse. But, <laughs> you know, all oh, the old ball and chain. By the way, can I, can, I just, can I just talk with you guys about that kind of stuff? We have a lot of jokes about marriage. We're not helping anybody with that attitude. We should talk very, very well about marriage. Uh, it's God's plan. It's God's institution. It is, uh, it, it is, it's his gift. It's a, it is a blessing. And, uh, and we should, um, it's really sad. You know, there's a lot of, I think a lot of guys, I think what it is is a lot of people, even in churches, they're miserable in their own marriage. They want to make others miserable too. <laughs> the old ball and chain. Right? Oh, I gotta go ch- check with the old wife. You mean you want to be on the same page with the spouse that you are one with? You say, I don't know what my husband's doing. That's not a healthy marriage. I don't know what my wife's gallivanting around doing. It's not, you know, I'm not asking her permission. She's not asking my we're making sure we're on the same page. We have, we have a life here, right? We have kids. We have, we have obligations. We have things going on in life. But, but I'll tell you what, folks, it is a blessing. It is a blessing. But we also ought not to look at it as, you know, I'm just going to be single the rest of my life. This is my lot in life, you know. Folks, that's a blessing. Sometimes, and by the way, Paul calls them both gifts. Every man has their gift, you see. So here's Henry just waiting for a wife. And, uh, and I would say to you, as long as you have this gift of singleness, Henry, enjoy it. You say, I'm not looking for a wife. I'm, you know, what are you, 15? Yeah, he's 15. He's like, what are you talking about? You're crazy. But let me just say, you know, and it may not be now, but, you, you know, you may get in your heart. I want to have a wife one day, okay? And, uh, but in the time, process, maybe when you're 18, maybe when you're 20, you're like, yeah, it would be nice to have a wife one day, you know. But while you're there, enjoy singleness but do it what paul's unpacking he says you know what you can serve god unhindered there's no one to check in with to make sure you're on the same page and all that kind of stuff you can serve god freely and he kind of goes on and talks about for the single person they can just throw it all in and just serve god and and whatnot but for the married person they can't serve god with the same intensity as a single person why because they have a spouse and they have to Uh, it talks about pleasing your spouse with the things of this world. You say, well, that sounds kind of carnal. No, no, it's not. Because I also have to love my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So if I sacrifice a little bit, I have to put a roof over her head, those kinds of things, I'll promise you I would not be living in a house as big as my house if I did not have a wife and four kids. I wouldn't need it. In fact, I could pastor a church and live out of my car. But if I told my wife, hey, we're going to go serve the Lord and live out of my car, I probably wouldn't stay married very long. <laughs> you see, there are certain things in this world, carnal things, if you would, for this relationship. Okay? Does that make sense? I mean, I'm not talking sinful. I'm talking just the things of this world. Right? And so, so they're both a blessing. Sometimes it may be for a season. Right? I am married. That's the given me, and that may be for a season. You say, well, what do you mean? God could take my wife away from me. I, I hope that wasn't prophetic. But, it, but I could go into a singleness season if something were to happen. By the way, I, I, I still see myself as very young. I've already lost a lot of friends to death. In fact, the guy that, that, uh, one of the guys that, that introduced me to my wife 20 years ago died of brain cancer a couple years ago. And so all, all I'm saying is, um, is we don't know. God could take my wife, and I will have to be okay with it. I'm not saying it won't hurt, but that will be the next gift that I would walk in. And for that season, I will be the gift of singleness. And I will serve God with that gift. Okay? So what I'm saying is we need to see it all as a blessing in that season. And see it in that light. But, um, but let's look at this. It says there, if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. Notice, notice who is the one departing and who's the one allowing the departure. Does the believer depart from the unbeliever? No. Does the unbeliever depart from the believer? In the text, yeah. If, if they want to depart, let them depart, right? 
But here's the thing. He says, let not any one of you put away your wife or depart your wife because it's, pa- it's in the passive tense. So, so here's the deal. For a believer, your husband, your wife has just had it with you. They're lost. It's not you as the believer to say, well, then just pack your bags and get out of here. No one's keeping you here. No, you live with them as long as they're pleased to dwell with you. And you just might win them with your chaste conversation. You just might win them over as you, as you learn to suffer like Christ suffered. Folks, I know this is hard because we, we say, no, we all deserve to be happy. No, we don't. Tell that to the suffering Christians in China, in Iraq. Can you imagine preaching that, that message over there? You know what, Christians? Jesus has saved you all so that you could just be happy and live your best life now. Folks, if my best life is now, that means I'm missing heaven. Best life now is for lost people because it only gets worse from here. So yes, we're going to suffer in this life. I'm not encouraging. I'm not saying, you know, hey, make your, make your marriage messed up so you suffer a little bit because we've got to live like Christians. But, but you know, we, we really need to think about this thing because it is a picture of Christ and the church. And why do you think the devil is so after marriages? I think that's one reason. He wants to mess up the picture. So if he messes up that picture... He's messed up our confidence in the church. Think about this. Think about a child growing up in a divorced home, reading the Bible, and they come across how Christ loved the church and gave himself for it in the same context as as husbands loving their wives. And he thinks, well, is Christ going to leave the church? Is he going to leave me? Or how about this one? You know, uh, God is our heavenly father. Will my earthly father abandon me? You see how the devil will wreak havoc with our thinking and try to and come to unreasonable conclusions about God because there's comparisons to our earthly relationships. So when we come to the qualifications of the pastor, I don't know why God chose us as one of them, but the qualification was he must be the husband of one wife. One wife. I think one of the big reasons for that is the picture. The picture of Christ in the church. I think another great reason is this. That pastor is going to be counseling couples that are struggling. And if he didn't make it work... How's he going to give anyone else advice? There was a pastor in my, my hometown who was uh, divorced and went through the divorce and stayed pastoring that same church and remarried. And, uh, and I knew somebody he was counseling for, for premarital counseling. And I thought, what does he have to share? <laughs> you, know, you see what I'm saying? Uh, it's not to say somebody who's divorced can't serve the Lord, but it's not my rules, it's his rules. I don't know why he chose that. It doesn't say that if anybody ever uh, 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 had a problem with drugs or alcohol, they can't pastor. It doesn't say, you know, this is like one thing that, hey, you got one shot. Some people try to say, well, that was before they got, they got saved. Well, it doesn't say that. And by the way, here's a good workaround. I didn't realize I wasn't saved, and now I'm saved. Okay, now you can be a pastor. It's like it was a reset button. Some people give the argument, well, you know, that's because in that day polygamy was allowed, and what it's saying is he's not to have multiple wives. But if he's been divorced, remarried, as long as he has one wife, uh, I do not believe it means one wife at a time. Okay. Remember Jesus when he uh, met the woman at the well in Samaria. He comes to her and, uh, and he tells her, he says, uh, he says, go and get your husband before I answer any more questions. Go and get your husband. She says to him, I don't have a husband. What does Jesus say to her? He says, no, no, you've got five. Interesting how he counted all five. You see, the divorce does not undo the one. It doesn't make it go away. He said, you have five. And the one you're now with is not your husband. In other words, she just stopped. I mean, isn't that our world today? We're just going to stop making it official. I'll just shack up with them. Um, So anyways, I do not believe having an unbelieving spouse is grounds for you as a believer to divorce. Now, if you receive a divorce, that's one thing. I mean, you can't undo it. You can't stop them. No, I refuse. Well, they're right in the divorcement. They're going to go. And some of us in this room, we know some people that's happened to Okay, and that's sad. But Paul says then to the unmarried, I, I, I would that you remain like I am. Okay, and that word unmarried, um, 
I do believe carries the idea that you were previously married, now you're not. Because it says the unmarried and the widows. Later on it says the virgins. There's two different categories going on here. Um, but just to remain there. And so, uh, so I believe, you know, you know, you do not have, and, and by the way, even if they divorce you, you, again, you're still not free to remarry. We see that in the context, verse number 11 again. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried and be reconciled to her, or be reconciled to her husband, and let the husband put away his wife. And so we see that reiterated a few times. And so, so the first issue that was brought up was, well, if there's ongoing immorality, you can divorce or remarry. To which I say, that is not God's plan. Okay. Now, you may run into Christians who are in their second marriage or third marriage, to the which I say, well, God hates putting away. So repent and make this marriage count. And you say, why do you say repent? I think it's good that we acknowledge and we say, you know what? This was not God's will, but now that we are married, it's God's will. We're in this thing. Amen. I like what, uh, um, I don't quote John MacArthur often, but uh, brother, now this is tw two twice in a week now I've quoted him. But he said this, and people will come to him and say, you know, preacher, I think I married the wrong person. He says, here's how you know if you married the, uh, who the right person is that you should marry. He said, go and pull out your marriage certificate and see whose name is on it. And he said, he said whoever's name is on that, that's God's will. <laughs> okay, It's true, right? I, we made a vow. All right. Um, and uh, by the way, young people, this is why you better be very careful that you're taking counsel and you're, you're really seeking God's best and God's will. There are a lot of people that have a lot of baggage they've got to overcome. By the way, we all have baggage, but some people have a lot of baggage they've got to overcome, right? And, uh, and we say we started out as a mess, but praise the Lord, He is in the business of fixing messes. And, uh, and many of us can attest to that. And so, so Todd Friel said uh, immorality. And um, ongoing immorality is grounds for divorce. I say no. Um, uh, an unbeliever, uh, you married to an unbeliever, I say no. The third one does not make any sense. He said the third reason is death. Can I tell you something? If your spouse dies, you don't have to divorce them. You have fulfilled your vow, right? What do we say at our weddings? Until when? Until death do us part, therefore your vow is fulfilled, okay? Um, but it even mentions that in the end of chapter 7 there, uh, in verse number 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she abide, in other words, she stays single, after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. And, uh, and by the way, the context is very important because he's talking about this present distress. And Paul was speaking to a time period where there, was a, there were some very, very difficult things happening in society. And basically what he was saying was, hey, if you're single, probably should just stay single now because of this present distress. Probably not a good idea to start something new, right? Um, it's probably the same advice I would say to someone in a war-torn country. You know what, right now it's probably not a good time to get married. You know, someone in Ukraine. You know, going through the things they're going through right now, you know, probably not a good time to get married. You, you got more important things to deal with right now. You see, that's kind of what Paul was talking about here. That's the context. He's not saying, look, guys, you know, because if you look at this, sometimes you might think, boy, Paul really is against this thing of marriage, you know. Guys, just stay like I am if you can do it, you know. And it's like, that's not what Paul's saying at all. Um, it's in the context of this present distress. But, uh, but anyways, uh, and then Romans talks about, makes the comparison of the law, being the, the old covenant has died. We're free to this thing of grace. And he says similar things with marriage. When, uh, uh, when the spouse passes away, you're free. That, that covenant has been fulfilled, and, uh, and you can make, you're free to make a new covenant. And um, so you don't obviously need a divorce for that. You are free to remarry. And in that sense, as well, when it comes to uh, when we talked about husband of one wife, uh, that, f that vow has been fulfilled. You still are the husband of one wife, though you had been previously married. Okay? Um, and so, so with that, there's my little Bible study on this hot topic for the evening. Um, I did mention, you know, there are going to be people, there's going to be people in our church that are on their second marriage and third marriage and and I think sometimes it can be almost envied by someone who knows what the Bible says and somebody else finds out what the Bible says later, you know, and I think we really got to, we just got to be gracious um, and, uh, and realize, you know, uh, I've, I've dealt with, I've met with people and they, they actually have come out and said, you know what, it wasn't God's will that we got married. 
I wish I knew that at the time. But we are married now, and I want to please God with this relationship. And many times there are multiple dynamics and, and blended families and those kinds of things um, that have to go along with that. But, uh, but uh, as a church, we, we need to help our young people to understand that this is a one-shot, one-shot deal. You say, well, I just don't think it's, you know, people have, told, people have said crazy things like, like uh, you know, I really prayed about it, and this is not working out. God's okay with me divorcing my spouse. Okay, well, now we know who the authority is in your life. Because it's not God. If God's already spoken to it, that should settle it. Okay? But then they'll say, well, I prayed about it, and uh, I believe I'm to remarry and marry this person. They've already been divorced. I believe it's God's will that I marry this person. I can tell you, it's not God's will. Did you know people die every day? <laughs> don't, don't, don't pray a prayer of iniquity now. People die every day. One way you will know it's God's will that you remarry is your former spouse will be dead. I mean, I'm not telling the saints to be ugly or anything like that. That is when your vow is done. Even if it was messed up somewhere along the way, a divorce took place, you're free to remarry when they pass. Okay? And, uh, and so God, God knows what he's doing. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not saying that to say go pray that God kills your, your ex. Okay? But, uh, but that's how you'll know it's time. That's one indication, all right? But, but with that, I just say this. Um, you know, and we ought to encourage people that have been through a divorce. We ought to encourage people that are single and wanting to get married and haven't been married yet. We ought to encourage people that are, uh, you know, that are single and just serving the Lord. That, that's a great opportunity. Hey, if you're married, serve the Lord together. Love God. Uh, invest in each other, even with the things of this world. To the single, give your all to the Lord. Serve God. Uh, you don't have the obligations that married people have. And serve God and be faithful in that. And, uh, and um, you know, there was a, uh, I'll, I'll close with this. Um, when I first stepped into the pastorate, uh, there, was a, there was a man in our church. He actually was my fourth grade teacher. And now I was his pastor. And he wasn't saved when he was my teacher. He got saved later in life. And uh, it was just awesome seeing his growth. Well, he was divorced. Uh, his wife had left him. And, um, and he sat down with me, he said, he said, Pastor, there's this uh, lady I've been talking to. And he said, before this thing gets serious, I just want to know what the Bible says. He said, is this okay? And I took him to some of these passages, and I didn't even start even explaining them. I just was reading, and he said, okay, I got, I got my answer. And he broke the thing off. And what was amazing was what I saw take place over the next couple of years, uh, the next several months, really. This man started so pouring into his relationship with the Lord and his walk with God. He had such a passionate, zealous relationship with the Lord that, quite frankly, I was jealous of him. You know, he's looking at me, oh, I wish I could have a wife. I was thinking, I wish I could walk with God like that. I mean, God truly became his everything. And, uh, and I thought, wow, what a, what a tremendous thing. You see, we get so caught up with the flesh, and we think, well, I don't... I can't enjoy this or I can't enjoy that. You know, I don't have the things that everyone else has. And, and, and we miss what God's trying to do in each of our lives individually. And so whatever we're at, and that's what Paul was saying, you know, each person has their own gift. Live in your gift. And he gives an example. He says, hey, if you're circumcised, don't seek to be uncircumcised. If you're, if you're um, bound, don't seek to be free. If you're married, don't seek to be single. If you're single, don't seek to be married. He said, he said live within your gift. And I think that's a great example for us today, that we're always looking at the grass being greener on the other side, and we miss what God has for us today. And uh, so I hope that's helped you.